Why don't we pause for a moment of prayer and ask the Spirit of God to be the teacher of God through the Word of God for the child of God, that we might bring glory to God. Father, we pause again realizing that mere man cannot affirm the Word of God as your truth convictionally. We understand that there's a lot of unbelieving biblical scholars, Old and New Testament, theological scholars, who can unpack a lot of the meaning but do not affirm this as your inspired and inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient word. So with humble hearts, we come to you again, thanking you for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit who helps us to understand your truth and affirm this as the very word of God. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear your message this morning that we might be changed. Lord, would you convict us of our sin, exhort us towards righteousness. Use your word mightily in our lives to effect life change for your own praise and glory. That when we leave the doors of this house of worship this morning, we would be better equipped to pursue Jesus. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Columnist Herb Cain wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle, Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion, or it'll be killed. Every mo morning a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or gazelle. That's not the point of the illustration. When the sun comes up, you better be running. Spurgeon wrote likewise. He said, if you're not seeking the Lord, the devil is seeking you. If you're not seeking the Lord, judgment's at your heels, unquote. In the Christian life, it's not enough simply to wake up. That's a good starting point. But we're called to run, to become more like Christ, to press ahead in godliness, to seek him more than we have sought him. Beloved, I'd like to preach to you a sermon that I've entitled entitled Learning to Aggressively Seek the Lord. Back months ago when we were in Mark 9, since we're, uh, Mark 6, excuse me, since we're going through the Gospel of Mark regularly, we're on a little summer break here, but in, in, John 6, uh, in Mark 6, we use John 6 to conclude the sermon because Jesus gets down into the diagnosis of the heart issue of the multiplication of bread and that's where our scripture reading was at last week, this week, and next week. So I thought it might be apropos. So here in, in John 6, when we think about seeking the Lord, to say we're seeking the Lord means we're seeking his presence, literally the face of God, which is the Hebrew way of having access to God, to find his presence. You might say we're already in the presence of God. After all, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. In a sense, he's near everything and everyone. He holds everything in being. He sustains all with the word of his power, even governing everything to his ordained conclusion. And in a second sense, you might say, well, Pastor Parker, he's always present with his children through covenant commitment to those who are adopted into his forever family through faith. And I'd, I'd agree with you. Yes. Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, which are his last words in the Gospel of Matthew. But there's also a sense in which his presence is not always with us, not in the fullness of expression. And it's not so much that God has moved, but our awareness and expression and recognition and aggressive engagement is what is lacking. Otherwise, it would be unnecessary for the repeated biblical admonitions to seek the Lord. Psalm 105, 4, seek the Lord, seek his presence continually. Why do we find that admonition so often in scripture if he's here in the same sense at all times? In Isaiah 55, we're told to bring our thirsty souls to God and to quell our hunger as we feast on him, to seek to be satisfied in him rather than the vain substitutions that so often demand man's affection. 
whether that be intimacy in a forbidden relationship, chasing after possessions, sports, education, gravitating toward them rather than being wrapped up in the goodness, greatness, and grace of our Creator, whom we now know as Savior and Lord. That's the issue before us this morning that we want to consider. And instead of seeking Him, we neglect Him in giving no or, or little thought. We don't actively place trust in Him and don't find Him manifesting His presence and nearness, which is our good. The psalmist says, The nearness of God is my good. He remains unperceived as great and beautiful and valuable in the eyes of our heart. He's hidden behind our carnal desires instead of sought and savored as the most precious one. You remember that parable Jesus told in Matthew 13 where he, he says that he, he's the pearl of surpassing value. He's the treasure hidden in a field that a man will sell, sell everything to buy that one field to gain that treasure. We don't treasure our Lord like we ought. And so we want to consider what it means and looks like to set our mind and heart on God. The conscious fixing and focusing of our mind's attention and our heart's affection. First Chronicles 22, 19 is one of those admonitions. To set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Paul puts it this way to the saints at Colossae. He said, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. See, we're seeking, we're just seeking in the wrong direction of the wrong things. So friends, I want to invite you to renew your mind through biblical principle and biblical example to follow on seeking the Lord in all of our lives, our motives, our thoughts, our responses, regardless of the situation of life. We can't change a, a good majority of the situations in our life, can we? They're, they're, and that's what we end up worrying about. We can't change the situation, but we can change our motives and our thoughts and our responses. We must grow in our pursuit and our seeking. Now, while the psalmist will be the instructor in the message this morning, Jesus, the master teacher, will point out the issue. So if you have turned to John chapter 6, we see the master teacher diagnoses the heart problem. Like I said several weeks ago, we were in Mark 6, and John 6 was our conclusion because John's presentation through the lips of Jesus, of Jesus' diagnosis of the issue and it was actually in our scripture reading this morning. Last week, in verses 1 to 15 in our scripture reading before the message, Jesus feeds 5,000 hungry men. And the Greek is very particular. Only men is what's included in the 5,000. In other words, you add in the women and children, there are multiplied thousands of people Fed. We call it the feeding of five thousands, but we understand exegetically there was upwards of maybe 18, 20,000 people there that he just multiplied on the spot food. Then one day later, as you move through John chapter six and you come to them, you know, in verse 25, they found him on the other side of the sea, and they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me. So they'd come around the, the, the Sea of Galilee to where he's at after he'd already filled their stomachs, because guess what? It's one day later, and they got more rumbly in the tumbly, as Pooh would put it. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So they're interested in bread, not interested in Jesus. And yet he sought to direct their attention to him, even though they're just as obtuse as you and I. They should have perked up at the prospect of eternal life. What's this you're talking about? Eternity in your presence? 
so that the grave's not the end of my story. But missing spiritual reality, they respond with verse number 28. Notice it. So they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And he counters that with verse 29. As he says to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Believe in me, is his answer to them. Well, it goes straight over their heads again, verses 30 and 31. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? What the, the work, as if the work yesterday of multiplying food in their sight wasn't enough. Yeah, you, you want me to add on to the signs. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So they, they missed the point. They didn't come seeking Jesus, but seeking a free lunch. Lord, would you just take away our earthly problems? Make life a little less painful? Would you add the spirituality that brings peace? But please, offer more than a relationship with you. Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament, specifically the wilderness wandering, as they were suffering the difficulties and the consequences of their own unbelief. How long were the children of Israel going to be on the backside of the desert, eating each other's uh, dust? 40 years until the unbelieving generation dies out. And so back in that event where, notice verses 32 and 33. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread out of heaven. It's my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So, you know, basically he's saying, you know, when you, when you guys were in Sunday school, you've heard since childhood manna, one of the greatest Old Testament stories of God multiplying food for tens of thousands of people. What you learned about in the days of Moses is just elementary. See, feeding thousands like Jesus did one day before this event, you know, he... He multiplied loaves for 5,000 men at another date in the, uh, the Gentile region. If you remember in our study of the Gospel of Mark, he multiplied it for 4,000 men. But this is not just a New Testament occurrence. It's not new for God to multiply food to feed his children. He's always been doing it. He rained down manna day in and day out, and they had the audacity to complain they're barely taking their toothpicks out to pull it out of their teeth, and they're saying, what is this stuff? It's so, it's, it's bland. I remember the leeks and garlic in Egypt land. Are you kidding me? And it's not, not new in, uh, for these disciples of this day in John chapter 6. He's teaching in the, in the discourse, I'm offering you what won't just fill your stomachs physical, earthly needs, or sustenance and fulfillment. I came into this world to give life. He offered to all, offers it to all who exercise repentant faith in him. Verse 34. So they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. We're in. Notice verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. So he clarifies, he makes clear that the bread that they need is not what fills their stomach. The bread they need is that living bread of life that fills their soul for time and for eternity. That's what they need. Unfortunately, the heart of man and his nature hasn't changed through the centuries and our aim is just as earthly as theirs was. Physical pleasure. We're pleasure seekers. We're idolaters chasing after cheap substitutes and filling our lives with everything but Christ. It's emptiness. It, you know, when uh, Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes, like we just started reading, was it last Tuesday? It's vanity. 
It's chasing after the wind. The moment you think you got it, it's like the first time you went to the fair and you got cotton candy and you, you raised your mouth as, as, high, as wide as you could to get, take a big bite of that cotton candy and all of a sudden there's nothing there. That's the chasing after our idols. Promising, but not delivering. You know, they wanted bread and stomach rather than their souls. The Jews were limited by mere physical perspective and were blind to the spiritual truth behind Jesus' illustration. They're more concerned with the body than with the soul. And yet how true has that been of you and I, dear friend? So Jesus drops the hammer and pushes for decision in verse, uh, verses 53 to 58. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died, but he who eats this bread will live forever. Metaphorically speaking, he calls them to eat and drink. And in this inspired analogy, it's very similar to what we're addressing this morning. Just a little different. Eating and drinking are absolutely essential for physical life, are they not? We can go a little bit longer without food than we can water, but we can't go without. So also, belief, an active trust in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is essential. You can't just know about it. You must depend upon it. You must respond. You must accept his cross work. You must believe in the sacrificial death, which is essential for eternal life. Which is even greater than the physical, which is just momentary. This which is beautifully pictured in corporate worship of the church. When we partook of the Lord's table together, we came together around the Lord's table last week. And we ate the bread and we drank of the cup, celebrating as a church once again, what happened 2,000 years ago, the blood that was poured out as a substitute for sinners, that he experienced the death that we each one deserves so that his righteousness, both in his life and his death, could be credited to us. Beautiful picture. But they're obsessed with bread. What they really needed most was being captivated with Jesus. He's virtually saying, I am what you need. Come to me. Don't search me out for what I can do for you. Seek me. Both for salvation and a sanctified walk. Beloved, we need to learn to relish our redemption, but also our Redeemer. It's not just for all the vittles he gives us. He is infinitely precious. To say that is to say it this way, as we often have said. Salvation isn't merely life insurance out of hell. It is forgiveness of sin, which guarantees eternity in his presence. It's relationship in this life as well as the life to come. That's what we're seeking after. To say that is to say, some of you have read uh, my buddy Milton Vincent's uh, Gospel Primer for Believers, helping us understand the gospel isn't past tense. We didn't just get saved how many days, weeks, or years ago, but we live every day of gospel sufficiency, gospel grace, gospel forgiveness, because the gospel is just as important today as it was the day we first heard it and responded. Once life began, however far back, and maybe it hasn't happened, if you have not come to faith in Christ, do so today. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow's the devil's day. Today's the day of salvation. But if, there, if you can look back at the history banks of your life and you know a time that you trusted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, that began a seeking. That didn't end the seeking. Once you came to him as Savior and Lord, we live in him. We cultivate this new relationship, this unique union with Christ. 
they failed to seek the Lord in John 6. So Jesus diagnoses the problem in, in John 6. Let the psalmist model us, what does this look like? What does this seeking after the Lord look like? And so point two is the Psalter's new song of seeking the Lord. Remember how the psalmist says that the Lord has put a new song in my heart? Our affections changed the moment we met the master. Our sin that we used to love, now we hate. And the righteousness we used to hate, now we love. And they've swapped. Now we're born idolaters, chasing everything other than him. And the day that we bowed to him as Savior and Lord, glory hounds have to give it up. Not about my glory, but his glory. We were stopped dead in our tracks when we repented and believed. We bowed to his lordship and became slaves, and now there's this new orientation in life. But even though we're saved, we're born again, we're adopted as for his forever family, we've got a new capacity to love him, which we didn't have, but we brought our sinful habits and desires and orientations with us, a lot of baggage. Every one of us bring our baggage with us to Christ. And so it begins this life of putting off sinful habits and replacing them with righteous ones and learning how to renew our minds to seek him in all the issues of life. As we learn the chorus of deliverance from sin, we're not necessarily delivered from those difficulties, but we're promised deliverance in those, in those difficulties. Can't change the circumstance, we can't change the situations, but we can learn how to exalt God in those difficulties. Not drawn into our own sinful motives and thoughts and responses as he habitually learned to lean and to seek. So friend, embrace your inadequacy of the flesh and self. We cannot do this. on our. We can't seek him on our own. Uh, I, I think I mentioned from that microphone over there, this is one of those mornings where the Lord reminds us that we are weak creatures. We leave the bulletin behind. We leave the report of concern behind. And it's all him. Okay, Lord, move on. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Even starting every day intentionally and actively seeking his presence before we seek the presence of anyone else. How often do we... First thing we're seeking is, okay, who texted me? What's going on on social media? Let me get to my YouTube uh, videos I watch. Oh, oh, yeah, I just ran out of time for my devotions. I got to get off to work. This part of the sermon probably develop uh, or look more like a Bible study than a sermon. So get your Bible ready. Be ready to jump around a bit. Turn back with me to the Old Testament... Old Testament hymnal, the book of Psalms. Let's start in Psalm 27 for a moment. Psalm 27. In Psalm 27, there are three conversations that the psalmist has on fearless trust in God. He, he learns how to talk to himself. You know, he talks to himself, then he talks to God, and then he talks to himself again. That's Psalm 27. Notice verse... Uh, you know, let's start at the beginning. You know, the, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Notice those personal pronouns. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries, my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Notice verse 4. One thing I have asked in the Lord, and that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. It's enough to be saved. You know, even to be a, uh, elsewhere the psalmist talks about, you know, just let me be a, a, a door tender. I don't have to be in the inner sanctum of where all the higher echelons of your sanctified saints are at. Just as long as I get in your presence, that, that's good enough for me. Jump down to verse 7. 
Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. He's already talked about his enemies that are after him. Be gracious to me, answer me. When you say, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. You notice his conviction. You said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Back in the, in Psalm 24, in verse 6, this is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Over in, no need to turn there, but uh, in Psalm 105, 4, it's that, that same testimony where he says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Oftentimes when we get ready to start the new year and we get these new year resolutions, oh yeah, I'm going to be better in my devotional life. And we might start off the first day or the first week well, and then we fall off the wagon, don't we? And uh, it's more intermittent. And yet he says, seek his face continually, learning how to live in the presence of the Almighty. But he's getting there. Look over at Psalm 33, if you would. Psalm 33. There's, what we've got here is a general hymn of praise with two themes. You've got the Lord's sovereign power in nature and the Lord's sovereign providence over human history. So there's praise for him as creator and there's praise for him as preserver. Notice how gratitude and praise characterizes life of worship not that of complaint. Down in verse number 18, for example. Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. Imagine that, that we have the, the glance of God as we are serving him. Verse 19, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine, our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Go over several Psalms to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. And while you're turning there, I wonder if your cry is as the chorus that we've sung before. That as the deer pants for the water brook, so my, pant, my heart pants after you, O God. Psalm 42. Now, you know, before we read a couple of these uh, stanzas, we don't know the historic occasion of Psalm 42, the exact situation, but we do clearly see the psalmist's situation is intense. It's greatly aggravated by surrounding mockers. And I... You know, i got to confess to you, I've been, uh, this, this message has probably been percolating for the last two or three years in my heart as I've been trying to learn from the psalmist how to seek the Lord more constantly in life. And I recall a time or two when the Lord rescued me through this very passage as I prayed it back to him and took my wounds and injustices to the God who is just. Again, we find himself, him talking to himself, and he, as he preaches the truth to himself, he meditates on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, and what is praiseworthy. Notice it. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Notice he doesn't minimize the hurts. And we confess that, but we take them to the Lord. We tattle on our enemies to God. You know, while they say to me all day long, where's your God, you Bible thumpers? You know, if God were really alive, wouldn't he intervene? Wouldn't he help you out? And they just mock all the day long. Verse 4, these things I remember, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession in the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Notice how he's questioning himself. Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O my God, 
My soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I'll say to, to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance in my God. You know, as he vents his lament to the Lord, you find him leaving this psalm off in hope and help as his countenance is lifted by God. Run over to Psalm 119 if you would. Psalm 119 stands as the Mount Everest of the Psalter. Whoever the psalmist is, whether it's David, Daniel, or Ezra, he's under serious duress as he pens the longest psalm and the longest chapter of the whole Bible. He expresses confidence in the word of God in every line. You know, this, when, when, as we're flipping through our Bibles, do we recollect that this is God's only manual on how to live to his glory? So why, why does it gather dust? Why aren't we in it more than we are? We find him reaching out for the Lord's commands. For instance, look at verse 41. This particular stanza. He says, may your loving kindnesses also come to me, O Lord. Your salvation according to your word. That word salvation, he, he repeats his desire all throughout Psalm 119. So I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. Do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. So he's, he's waiting patiently for the Lord. Verse 44, so I'll keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk it at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love. And I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. You know, those last couple of verses in that stanza, 47 and 48. He's loving God's word more than man's word. Do we not have plenty of relatives and co-workers and neighbors who always have an opinion about virtually everything? And yet their counsel, is it inspired? Their counsel, is it inerrant without error? Is it authoritative in our lives? Is it absolutely sufficient addressing the questions that we have about life? We find in Psalm 119, especially that stanza we read together, a leaning into God's promises, not man's weak promises. George Mueller, many of you have read his biography. George Mueller trusted God as a pastor and as a director of an orphanage that cared for thousands of destitute children. His partner in ministry was his wife, Mary. Their marriage was so happy that Mueller testified that he never saw her at any time without a, a new feeling of delight. When she died, 1870, after 39 years of marriage, he continued to trust in God and his goodness. And the scripture he chose for the funeral sermon that he preached was Psalm 119, verse 68, which says, Thou art good and doest good. What did he tell us about God? You are good and you do good. The three divisions of his sermon were, the Lord was good and did good, first in giving her to me. Funeral sermon for his wife, point number two, in so long leaving her to me. And third, in taking her from me. Can we see the goodness of God when we don't see the wisdom of God? But when we can't see his hand and what he's doing, we trust his heart that is only good towards his children. 
back in Psalm 77, if you wanted to turn with me, this little Bible study on the psalmist seeking to teach us how to seek. Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, Asaph illustrates one cure for depression. As he commits to focus on God's goodness and past deliverance, he vents his lament to the Lord, his bitter complaints turn to hymns of praise. And he ends with the good shepherd who leads him like a flock. Notice it. Verse 1, he says, My voice rises to God, and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted. You know, this is when you keep keeping on in your prayer time with God. When I remember God, then I'm disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. You've held my eyelids open. The sovereign one doing that. I'm so troubled, I can't speak. I've considered the days of old, the years of long ago. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. Will the Lord reject forever? Have you find yourself asking that question? Will he never be favorable again? How long is this difficulty going to go on? In other words, verse 8. Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? Then I said, it's my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I remember your works of old. I'll meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O oh God. The waters saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth a sound. Your arrow, arrows flashed here and there. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Seemed like everything's in chaos in life. Your way was in the sea and your paths in the mighty waters and your footprints may not be known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. When everything was chaotic, God still led his sheep along. Let's turn over to 143 for just a moment. Psalm 143. He fervently appeals to God's character and for him to hear his prayer. That's how he begins. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness and your righteousness. He remembers in verse 5, the days of old. Can we ever find a time either in inspired history banks or in the, the history banks of our own memory a time that God has not been faithful, not a one. So this remembrance is good for us. Notice how God is active as the psalmist is active. Verse 8, let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. What I want you to see in verses 8 and 9 is verbs. This is the action. Here he is trusting. Here he is lifting up his soul. Here he is taking refuge in God. The life of the believer is not one of passivity. He says, I trust. I lift, I take refuge. Over in 145. Psalm 145, I read the first few verses for our call to worship, to orient our minds to worship this morning. Down in verses 18 to 20. What a grand promise. He says, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He'll also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. So here David 
penned this most exquisite conclusion to all 75 psalms in the Psalter that he wrote. Here, the king of Israel extols and celebrates the king of eternity for who he is, for what he has done and what he promised. He promises God's nearness when he seems so far off. The promise is salvation when we can't deliver ourselves. The promise is for him to preserve that which we can't keep. Flip way back to the fourth psalm, would you? The fourth psalm. Psalm 4 has some similarities with the one that precedes it, Psalm 3. The former is sometimes labeled a morning psalm, while Psalm 4 has been called an evening psalm. In both, David is besieged with suffering and injustice and oppression in life. Circumstances don't change. But you see a shift in his thinking as he moves from worry and anxiety to that of worship and assurance. He does so by plotting a, a new trail, a path of righteousness consisting of prayer and trust in God. In the previous psalm, in Psalm 3, he learned to seek the Lord's face and embrace him as his shield. And in verse 5 of Psalm 3, he, he laid down and slept and awoke for the Lord to stain me. That while he was sleeping, God was awake, preserving him. And he prayed for the Lord to arise and to save because salvation belongs to the Lord. Even if he doesn't save us from the issue, he will save us through that issue, whatever it is. You know, so Psalm 4, he be begins with him in his prayer closet as he instructs enemies to trust in the Lord, even meditating in his heart on, on their beds, implying that what he does, as the Lord lifts up the light of his countenance and puts gladness in his heart, Verse 1, he says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You've relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me. Hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach to you? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Do we not get a little bit annoyed with the idolaters all around us, even though we are fellow idolaters? We've given up the idols that many of them chase after and fill them with others. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Verse 4, he says, tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, make me to dwell in safety. You know, as I read verse 7, more than when their grain and new wine abound, when it seems, Lord, like the wicked are prospering and are fulfilled with their empty idols, my soul is full to overflowing. Their stomach might be full, but their soul is empty. Over in Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, the first verse is the only prayer. And the rest is David's personal testimonies of trust. Matter of fact, there's a, a sermon on our website when I did re remember the recorder. Um, by that title, if you want to look at a study of Psalm 16, test David's testimonies of trust. Verses... One to three, he says, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. That's how God's going to preserve him. As David leans into him, I said to the Lord, you're my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they're the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. In verse four, he, he refused the idolatry characterizing those all around him. That which used to be characteristic of his own life. But as he's been growing in worship and his service of the one true God, he's learning how to chase after God 
more consistently than the false gods of his own imagination. Sorrows are multiplied in chasing false gods, be they wine, women, or wealth, like Solomon experienced. Verse 5, he finds satisfaction and fulfillment in the Lord. The Lord's my portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. Verse 6, there's, there's blessing and bounty. Lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Notice an Old Testament saint who has learned to seek the Lord. As he sets the Lord continually before him. I'm skipping over so many pages. I'd love to spend more. Uh, flip over to Psalm 25. Can't miss out on this. You're, in Psalm 25, David's not emphasizing a pie in the sky mentality that shaves the edges off the heavy issues of life in a fallen world. In a fallen world, life is hard, it's heavy, and many times it really sucks, doesn't it? It's hurtful, it's painful. And yet he affirms his dependence. And dependence is not a bad thing as the world preaches to us. Because he needs to learn how to trust God, no matter the troubles or the troublemakers. You know, when he doesn't know which end is up, where to go, what to do, he says in verse 4, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Notice how he's leaning into God's promises, just like in Psalm 119. To say that is to say this. When people are saying, well, God told me it does and such. Can I just say that the Spirit's lips are sealed if your Bible's closed? This is the spirit of revelation that inspired his word, and he never contradicts it, but speaks in accord with the open word. So here he is leaning into God's truth. There's a reason why God inspired scripture, that as we commune and learn to listen to him and align our wills with his in our prayer time, and as we read the scriptures, he makes our path straight. That's why in verse 5, he, he waits for God all the day. John Newton, author of the hymn Amazing Grace, watched cancer slowly and painfully kill his wife over a period of several months horrible experience. In recounting those days, Newton said this. He said, I believe it was about two or three months before her death when I was walking up and down the room offering disjointed prayers from a heart torn with distress that a thought suddenly struck me with unusual force to this effect. The thought that the promises of God must be true. Surely the Lord will help me if I am willing to be helped. It occurred to me that we are often led from an undue regard of our feelings to indulge that unprofitable grief which both our duty and our peace require us to resist to the utmost of our power. I instantly said aloud, Lord, I am helpless indeed, I myself, but I hope I am willing without reserve that thou shouldest help me. Newton was helped in a miraculous, in a seemingly remarkable way. During those remaining months, he carried out his duties as an Anglican minister and was able to say, through the whole of my painful trial, I attended all my stated and occasional services as usual. You know that Mueller wasn't the only one that preached his wife's funeral. John Newton preached his wife's funeral. How was the author of Amazing Grace helped? Because he chose to be helped. He realized it was his duty to resist, to be the utmost of our power in ordinate amount of grief and distraction. Though he grieved, he didn't grieve without hope. Like I did. He realized it was sinful to wallow in self-pity. 
Then he turned to the Lord, not even asking, but only indicating his willingness to be helped. He wrote this. He said, I was not supported by lively, sensible consolations, but by being able to realize to my mind some great and leading truths of the word of God. You see, it was the Spirit of God who helped him by making the needed truths of Scripture alive to him. He chose to trust God. He, he turned to God in an attitude of dependence and was enabled to realize certain great truths of Scripture that day in the days after. This is verse 5's lead me with truth like that. Are you claiming God's promises? Are you looking at the certainties rather than the situations? He says in in you I trust. Isaiah states the same thing in Isaiah 26. He says, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Why? Because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. And as I skip over so many of these psalms this morning, now that we've barely broken the uh, broken in the pages of psalms together in our ever so short Bible study, I'd exhort you to continue the practice of sitting with the psalmist. Build a habit of treasuring the psalms as they help you in how to seek the Lord. Maybe you would re-listen on the website or on YouTube and jot down some of the verses that you could commit to memory, that you would meditate to fill your mind and renew your mind. Use them to wash away wrong and sinful false thoughts with the water of the word. Fill your arsenal full of the weapon of the word to ward off the despairing darts of the devil. Now, dear friends, I understand that we imperfectly, impassionately pursue the Lord. That's the message today. When we fall off the way and we get back up and we start again. We're prone to wander, as the old hymn says, prone to leave the God we love. There is a tendency in our hearts towards this Laodicean Christianity to be lukewarm rather than red-hot communion. We ought to beg him for more. He promises to the seeker to meet them. If we look inward, we come up empty. There's no hope. We look outward and upward, there are pleasures forevermore. But I fear that we might get through any, you, you name any trial in life that you've gone through or mark this down for Monday morning. We might never learn the lesson. Never grow to be more like Christ. God might physically deliver us from cancer. God might financially deliver us from debt and a lost job or a lost home. You fill in the blank whatever it is that he might deliver us from and yet us not learn how to seek him. It's been a lost trial. Wasted. Has our faith been strengthened? Has communion been cultivated? Have we drawn closer in fellowship? to the one who died for us and rose again and is coming again. Seek the Lord while he may be found. We read in the scriptures that the name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous run to it and they are safe. Some disciples were coming to Jesus. Not so much unlike in John 6, but in Matthew 6. And they're worrying about what are we going to eat and what are we going to wear? These are necessities of life. And he helps them get their eyes off food and clothing. And he says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'll take care of all of this. Seek me. Not fallen logic. Not your experience. Not your worry. Put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. Now, returning your thoughts to Jesus in, in John 6, and we'll close there. When he said, uh, no need to turn there, as long as we're together. Uh, and I apologize, right? The preacher would say the lesson's 
You know, Jesus said to those following him that day to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. Why do we do that? Well, it's when we look to him in faith. When we believe he's who he said and he actually did what he said he did. That Jesus came as a savior bringing eternal life to a lost and dying world. He didn't come as a waiter serving bread to a crowd of greedy people who would come back the next day. Lord, we're hungry again. He came to deliver from the power and penalty of sin, not to meet perceived needs, that if lonely, he'll be your friend, or if single, he'll be your companion, that if you feel rejected, he'll be your encourager, or if you're broke, he'll make you rich. He promise any of that. John 6 teaches clearly his identity and his mission as Savior from sin. End of story. Sin is the worst problem you and I have to offend. And he forgives, he cleanses, he delivers, he changes. And like I said at the outset of the message, if you have not Pled to Jesus, they say, the Lord, do it today. If you've got questions about forgiveness of sin and salvation of Christ, we'd love to sit down and talk. If you want to uh, invite them a coffee, coffee's on Grace Bible Church. And we'd love to meet and engage with you on the gospel. You come to Christ, continue to seek him as an adoring worshiper. Grow in this discipline. Grow in your pursuit and love of him. Because sin is not just our lawlessness and stepping over the line. Sin is also seeking satisfaction anywhere but Christ himself. That's an idol in biblical theology. You know, as I was writing this up this week, uh, Jeremiah was just leaning into my shoulder in Jeremiah 2. He says, my people... Speaking for the Lord, Jeremiah says, My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We've got a natural inclination to look to other things for refreshment of our souls rather than to the Lord as our chief satisfaction. Isaiah would be the first one in Isaiah 55 too to turn from these to the triune and living God. Probably don't remember the sermon title, but it was learning to aggressively seek the Lord. Yeah, we talked a lot about seeking the Lord, but how aggressive are you? How active are you? Develop a plan and discipline yourself as to how you will seek him. It's a conscious choice. Plan. We don't coast through. Let's look the Lord in prayer together, shall we? Father, you present us in Scripture Christ Himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We want to pray with the psalmist as he's prayed so often. We know we want you, but we don't want you like we need to want you. Help us to be able to sing and to pray that we want you more than gold and silver because only you can satisfy. Lord, might you direct our hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. We thank you even for your promise in the, the faith chapter of Hebrews that you reward those who diligently seek you. Help us in this endeavor today and the coming days should Jesus tarry. Offer your praise and glory that you'd make us better seekers of you. We pray in your son's most precious name. Amen.